this week's episode of Stream Squad. So I am Angela. I'm here with Nick, and Dan is behind the camera. Hello, Whitney, everyone. Whitney's not on set today, but she should be looking in the comments, so you'll probably see her popping up here and there. But uh, how's how are you guys doing today? How's things going? I'm good. You've <laughs> <laughs> been on calls all day. Yeah, I got. Yeah, much. Nick's tired of it's talking. Sad. I have a feeling. I'm doing good. <laughs> doing great. I haven't done much talking, so I'm ready to start talking. Yeah. We gotta adjust this camera. Is what I also have to do. So <laughs> I'm gonna let you guys get into it while I fix the colors on this one camera angle. Okie dokie. Well, to get started, we've got some industry news. So the first thing is that Facebook has just hired Jennifer Dolsky from Change.org to help with really pushing Facebook groups further. So in the past, they've had a lot of focus on your personal timeline. They've had a lot of focus on pages, but now there's a huge push on groups. And I'm definitely seeing that all over my Facebook right now. Yeah, I went to the F8 Facebook Developers Conference earlier this year, and there was one part of the presentation. They broke out the different ways that we interact with people from uh, personal relationships with friends and family that are very close to friends, to communities, uh, and, and how our interactions with those different groups are different. And one of the big takeaways from that particular segment, and, and I think we see it with this higher at Facebook, is an emphasis on communities and groups. Uh, Facebook even had a conference in Chicago earlier this year around the same time as VidCon that was specific to groups and communities. So I, I think, um, we see it ourselves with the Switcher Studio Enthusiast group where there are Switcher users that are talking with one another and sharing pictures and answering questions and helping one another out. And it's been, it's been great for our community and people that are using our product and, and making great videos. Um, and, and this happens across the board. You see schools that are using Facebook groups um, for different clubs and organizations for athletics. We see it in churches. Um, we see it with newspapers and uh, community staples that, that share information. Uh, and, and I think as Facebook being a platform that a lot of people visit daily and spend a lot of time on, being able to bring people together and share ideas and schedule events and um, just facilitate the things that they're already doing, it, it's, it's been a really great tool for those communities, but also Facebook uh, is, is putting more resources into making that a better experience. and probably making money on it at some point as well, but this particular hire, uh, former CEO of change.org, is uh, it just really highlights that they're putting a big emphasis on this and see it being a big part of Facebook's future, especially in the, the next couple of years. Yeah. And I know she put an official statement on her Facebook and she said she was really excited about this, but her main push for groups is, you know, especially with kind of the polarized like this side or this side state after the last election a lot of people were starting to be afraid to voice themselves regardless of where they still on an issue on their main facebook page especially with family members and stuff like that and she's seen a lot of people really going into groups where even if it's a large group it's a large group of like-minded people where they're able to express themselves or even just hobbies they have without the fear of being judged so she's really taking that emphasis and trying to group things together and find ways to say, you know, the people that are on this page all share this in common. How can I get them to band together and create a group from that? So she's really kind of pushing that community aspect. And even in my own personal page, when I scroll through my feed, now all of a sudden it's not only timeline posts. I'm getting a lot of what's happening in my groups that's automatically coming up for me to see. So it's no more search. It's just readily available. Yeah. Um, so be on the lookout for more developments with groups in Facebook, especially as they um, put a bigger emphasis on it with this new hire. Yeah. And the other thing we have to talk about today is uh, Patreon has just raised $450 million. Not raised $450 million. They're valued. Oh, they yeah, raised money at a $450 million, million dollars. valuation. So for those of you that aren't familiar with Patreon, it's a platform that allows creators to... Uh, fund their activities by taking donations from those that watch their content. And uh, Patreon facilitates this process and they're building other tools and mechanisms to help uh, find other ways of monetizing video for creators that are maybe starting out on YouTube and, and don't have a million followers yet. It's hard to make a buck on YouTube. But if, you, if you're building an audience and you've got people that are interested in your content or you're trying to get started and get a new camera, 
you know, Patreon can be a great platform to help facilitate that fan interaction and to make some money uh, by getting those that watch your content to help support what you're doing. Uh, Patreon only takes 5% of the funds in that transaction. Like it's, it's really creator heavy. And this new round of funding um, <clears throat> should give them some legs and, and help creators know that they're going to be around for a while and put more confidence in what Patreon is doing. This year, they are on target to pay out $115 million to creators. Uh, they're only making seven and a half million on those transactions. So for them to raise money at a, almost a $450 million dollar valuation where they're only making seven and a half this year, um, there's, there's a lot of buy-in from the community and their investors uh, that they're going to have a lasting impact. And uh, we even saw this at VidCon this year. It was one of the conferences we attended. There was a session where the CEO of Patreon was on stage and talked about the transition that they're seeing in the creator or in, in the online video space where there's more emphasis on creators. If you went to VidCon a few years ago, if you were in the industry track, a lot of the conversations were about big business and brands and uh, just how you make money on YouTube. And, and all of it was about pulling things from viewers and pushing ads and just the machine that is online video. And there wasn't a lot of focus on the people that are actually making content. It was all about the money making part. And Patreon is a tool for creators. It's something that allows people that are making video to either grow and do more or people that are maybe quitting their day job so that they can keep producing this content uh, to be able to support their activities and what they're doing. And uh, we feel that Switcher kind of falls in that pool as well as a creator tool. And what, what we're doing today and what Patreon is doing, you just you wouldn't have seen that four or five years ago. So it's been really cool to see kind of this transition as online video continues to grow and as more people take notice uh, that, that there's a space and a need to support those that are creating content. And um, really, really stoked for the guys at Patreon and, and their team and what they're doing. Yeah. And um, if, if you're looking to connect with your viewers and you need financial support, um, it's a great tool to help connect with your audience and, and help facilitate that. Yeah, I know one thing for me, I've really seen Patreon kind of getting a big push this year, especially um, with YouTube, be able to get into what's really happening with AdSense, but YouTube's changed the way their AdSense works, their monetization, where they're focusing on more family-friendly content, which has left a lot of, you know, the more kind of niche tracks not getting as much funding as they were about a year ago. So you had a lot of YouTubers, you know, basically seeing a pay cut and saying, what are we going to do? Do I have to give up my channel? With the rise of Facebook and Twitch, a lot of people were going to those, but there's not the immediate opt-in monetization that YouTube had. So it was them saying, hey, I want to create video, but I don't have the time. I have to work this extra job where people, if they enjoy someone's content, they can donate maybe $5 a month. It all adds up. And you see a lot of creators just gradually able to cut their hours, as Nick said, sometimes get rid of their day job and do it full time. It's all funded by Patreon. And even recently I've seen with Patreon going, it helping a lot of writers and artists and everything where they've noticed what's happening. So now even painters are going on Patreon and able to do the same thing, further their craft just from interacting with fans, giving back to fans, and as a result, fans directly, you know, giving them just a little bit of money every month. Um, if Whitney was here, she could fact check me on this, but there's a, a YouTube channel, I think it's called Nerd Writer. Whitney, get in the comments, help us out here. <laughs> and uh, it, it's a, a really cool channel, if it's the one that I'm thinking about, <laughs> where, they, where they take they take movies and, and trends and media and dissect them, and it's very educational and it's very well produced, and it takes a tremendous amount of time. And um, there's a really big value there because it's not just entertainment, it's very educational. And uh, this particular creator has been able to do this uh, because of Patreon. And I, I think there would be a hole in the world if it weren't for channels like this. And so um, what, what Patreon allows, it's, it, it's not the distribution platform, it's not the place you go to watch. It's something you can layer on top of that as a creator to um, get that support from your audience, whether you're streaming to Twitch or Facebook or YouTube or wherever. And so uh, if you haven't heard of them, check it out. 
and um, we'll try and make friends with those guys too and figure out how to how to hook that in with the things we're doing. Well, I think that's one of the one of the cool things you say you said um, it's not really where they go to watch, but sometimes you can get special content content from those areas where. I'm seeing uh, people do live streams for their They'll Patreon people. They'll give a priority people, or early access. Pri- or yeah. early access, or they're giving people, it's like, hey, come hang out on this live stream and I'll answer questions. Right. Which I think could be a really cool tie-in with Switcher, where it's like, hey. Let's see what you did there. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> uh, so what else we got on the, the um, news? That is it for our industry news segment. Um, we can go ahead and move into our strategy segment. We've actually got two things to discuss with you guys today. The first is basically how to get started with live video and some best practices for the first time you go live to get the best broadcast you can and kind of reduce some of that stress you might have before hitting the button for the first time. And also, everyone knows that networking can be a make it or break it for streaming. So how to get some of the Wi-Fi best practices out of the way as well. So that way you're not worrying about that that first time you're going live. And I think Nick's going to discuss that a yeah, little so bit Yeah, so the, the first post you talked about, that's on the website. If you go to switcherstudio.com uh, or, or look at any of our social channels, you should be able to get to that. Um, just talking about planning your first broadcast and um, how, how to – just things to take into consideration as you prepare for that first stream. Uh, if you're using something like Switcher and you're doing live video, the networking or Wi-Fi component is, is really important, making sure you have a good connection. And uh, I think a lot of times, we, we even do it ourselves, uh, we play the blame game with internet service providers. It's like Time Warner is not good enough or I can't get a fast enough speed from Verizon on my phone. Uh, if you're doing the multi-camera component of Switcher, uh, any, any hiccups or problems you have there are going to be related to your local network. Uh, so what happens on your Wi-Fi router? And some things that, that uh, can have a big impact on that are using newer routers that are 5 gigahertz capable, uh, also having your router centrally located, um, and, and keeping it close to your devices that you're using with Switcher. So something you could consider doing is wherever the, the port on your wall is, the, the internet cable is, is running a longer cable to position your router closer to your production proximity has a big impact on what you can do um, over Wi-Fi. You even see this at home. If, if you have a router in your living room and you're three rooms over, uh, you probably don't have as good of a connection and things are probably a little bit slower the further that you get away from that and the more walls you put in between it. So uh, that, that proximity piece and, and having your router centrally located is a, a big contributing factor to the performance you can expect over Wi-Fi. The other one we've, we've seen suggested in the user group and that we hit on in this article is getting your router off the floor. Um, I, I think if you walk into just about anybody's home, they've got a ugly router that's a, just a box that was part of their cable plan, uh, or they bought a router from Best Buy or Walmart that has a bunch of antennas on it and it's ugly, and so it's shoved behind their TV and a nest of cables underneath of everything. And if you think about Wi-Fi and networking, it's broadcasting signals. Uh, it's broadcasting radio waves. And if it's on the floor, those aren't going to be able to go very far. So getting your router up off the ground uh, allows those signals to actually carry further. So those, those are some basic tips that you can take into consideration. Uh, if you're doing live video, use a 5 gigahertz capable router. Get it centrally located or close to your devices. Move the router closer to your devices as possible. And get it up off the ground. Uh, that article goes out tomorrow. It goes into more detail on those pieces. And uh, we also dig into the Google Wi-Fi networking setup a little bit there. We're going to be doing some more tests and videos and demos here at the office on that as well. Not here at the office, actually going out in the wild and using uh, that networking setup in some different situations. So stay tuned. (laughs) Yeah, that that is the one thing I always say. What are the two biggest hang-ups with with Switcher and it's – or with really any multi-camera piece and it's networking and audio, so – um, we're, we're trying to make it as easy as possible for everybody. Yeah, and even just things you wouldn't think of. You know, one reason it's really good to have that 5 gigahertz network is there's less interference. I know with the 2.4, which is kind of the default, just tiny things you wouldn't really think about, like microwaves or baby monitors or aquariums, those are actually on a close enough frequency where they will tank your Wi-Fi. If you're on a 2.4 and walk past a microwave, you'll see the signal on your phone go down. So 
really important to get to that 5G HC if at all possible. If you can't really take a look at what's around your room, if you've got something emitting a frequency in the room, it might be good to move that out or find another place to shoot just to keep away from any interference last minute. Well, class magic, it works for the most part. And you <laughs> shouldn't have to think about it. Um, but if you're in a situation where you can think about it, you can set yourself up for success. Um, and, and again, the Google Wi-Fi router that's coming out, uh, we're talking a little bit about in this post tomorrow, is a really easy, a uh, piece of hardware to set up and a, a really easy piece of hardware to expand and, and grow and do more in the future. Uh, and, and starts at around $100 to get started. So if uh, you're not happy with your home router, it's it's a really good one to take a look at and uh, is, is really scalable and something that you can add to to do more in the future. So um, again, that post comes out tomorrow and we'll be talking more about that in the upcoming and if I can just interrupt for a second, we're getting some really good comments and questions coming in. Um, I, I want everyone to know that we're kind of on a little time crunch today to, to get this done. Um, That's but, me. <laughs> but we will make sure to, to answer all those questions. Um, I guess one, if you want to touch on quickly, Nick, uh, Carlos asked, what is, the, what is the best suggestion to do multi-camera with Ethernet? Um, if you want to kind of run through that, I might be able to get you a couple of the pieces. Yeah. Um, and then the other one, NDI, he brought up too. I know we've mentioned that before. It's yeah. So uh, in, NDI is a, a new uh, protocol that te uh, New Tech developed for their TriCaster units for video over network. Um, the it's only been around for a year or two, and initially there were some concerns over how well it would be adopted. It looks like it is a, a protocol that's going to be here to stay. Um, and, and, and something that we have taken a look at before, but it's primarily used in high-end uh, broadcast solutions and studios. Uh, it, it hasn't necessarily been optimized for mobile uh, or doing things on these devices. There are some, uh, there's a, an app that New Tech developed for their workflows that work with that. Um, so it, it's, it's more of a high-end uh, video over IP solution and codec. And it's something that we, we may consider in the future, but right now it doesn't, doesn't really tie into the switcher workflow. And there's some other things that we're looking at uh, that we think you all are going to be excited about to, to open some things up beyond just um, what you see in the switcher experience today. Uh, if you're doing internet uh, or streaming with your iPhone, you're almost always going to be on Wi-Fi. That's just how we think about using these devices. But we have recently found a workflow where you can actually connect a physical Ethernet cable to your iPhone or iPad, and that's using a combination of the Lightning to USB uh, 3 adapter, where you also have to provide power, and the USB to Ethernet adapter. So using the two of these together, uh, you can connect to your iPhone or iPad, provide power, um, and then connect your Ethernet cable. And if you do this to your primary device, and this cable goes to your router, your other devices could be connected over that, that wireless network for your, the, the local network. Uh, if you have a router that has multiple Ethernet ports, you can also uh, hardwire all of your devices if you want. So there's some good articles on our website in the knowledge base um, and in, in the switcher blog on that particular workflow. And we can talk more in the user group on, on some mm -hmm. of the technical stuff there. Um, as far as questions, if you all want to stay on after our rollout or we can get in the comments afterwards, we'll be sure to come back to those. Yeah, Carlos had a, Carlos just had a few. Um, Carlos, what I'd recommend, you're asking a lot of really good questions. Just email us at support at switcherstudio.com and we'll, we'll get those answers or we'll get those questions taken care of, care for you. Um, moving on. Yeah. Well, speaking of the user group and Facebook groups, as we discussed earlier, um, we always like to take a look at what's going on in the user group and bring some of the, you know, kind of best examples of the conversation to you guys each week on Stream Squad. Um, two of the things that have come up this week, one of which is, you know, iOS storage in general for your iPhones and iPads and ways to ma manage that. That's become really important with the release of iOS 11 yesterday. Um, it's a lot larger update than a lot of the past have been. It's 2.05 gigs to update that. So there have been a lot of users, not just in our group, but worldwide, who have had trouble installing that update because their storage was already so full. Um, so we'll go ahead and talk about that a little bit, just some best practices for storage. So Dan, I think this one's yours. 
Yeah, so um, the big thing that I've noticed with, um, with at least with Switcher is how people are getting files off. And uh, sometimes those journal files take a long time to compile um, over the internet connection. So you used to be able to just plug your um, iPad or iOS device right into your computer, open iTunes, you choose like the app icon there and then you scroll down and you'd be able to like drag and drop files off of it. Um, well that app feature or that app tab went away um, and some people were a little worried about what to do with that. And um, it's a real simple fix um, we were able to find here. Let me um, pull up iTunes. I'll show you all exactly how to get to that spot. Um, maybe if my the Dan, cable. Real, real quick, I'm probably going to have to run, but I think if you all can take it from here, give them the walkthrough on this new iTunes workflow. And we've got a really cool example of a, a video that was made with Switcher this week from uh, McDonald's that yeah. we're going to take a look at. And uh, we'll be sure to jump in the comments after the broadcast as well. So I'll let you all keep going. Cool. Um, and I'll try and keep an eye on what's going on and, and check back in. Awesome. Okay. Angela, actually, I'm going to let you go ahead and um, talk about our our um, the made with switcher right now. I've got the cable I'm using right now. It just doesn't want to work, so it's not actually connected to my camera. So okay. I'm going to let you um, bring that up if you're good with it. And sure. yeah. Yeah, so as you guys might know, in our user group, a lot of people will post examples of videos they've created. Sometimes it's a, you know, kind of look what I did. Sometimes it's look what I've done. How can I make this better? And we love seeing that content. Um, the video for this week is from a company called Big Tasty Arabia, and they're part of McDonald's uh, from Dubai, and they've been doing a lot of advertisements for the new Big Tasty meal from McDonald's, and their streams are hilarious. They actually reached out to me just through Facebook and said, hey, when you have a minute, can you check out our video? And I instantly shared it to the rest of the team. So what they've been doing is advertising, you know, the Big Tasty, and they've been going live almost every day with just a fun competition. There's not really a winner from the competition, but they're just having people interact with them in the comments. They're randomly pulling out balloons and guitars and harmonicas. They're singing, they're dancing, they're rapping. Just huge entertainment for this new food product. And they're using a bunch of... Uh, Switch your studio assets like angles and graphics as they're doing it. I'm not sure, uh, Dan, do you have the video for them? Um, yeah, we actually already watched. Let me pull okay. it up again for you. Because <laughs> yeah. it is pretty amazing. Balloons and... And what's great about it is whenever they go live, they actually do two live broadcasts in a row. And they'll do one broadcast in English and they'll do the second broadcast in Arabic. So that way, no matter which of their main viewer base they're hitting, each of the viewers can see one of the broadcasts and understand it fully. Uh, they switch up hosts on who does the English and who does the Arabic each time, but they're both hilarious. I definitely recommend checking out Big Tasty Arabia. Even if you have, you know, even if you don't plan on going to McDonald's, it's still a great live show they've been able to pull out. Awesome. All right, good news. I was able to find another cable that, that's working with this, so... <laughs> Let's go to my iTunes. And the, this, again, if you're just joining us, is going to show you how to um, kind of drag and drop your files off of your iPad. We'll use this doing Switcher, um, but there used to be the little app tab that would show up on the side. Um, but that's gone now with the new iTunes version. But still, so yeah, it used to apps would just show up right over here, and you'd be able to scroll down and find what you wanted to do with it. Um, well, now it's even easier. You just have to go to the file sharing. And I guess they just really just renamed it. And then I can choose switcher here, whichever one I'm, I'm using. And all those files are right there. So I'll, that's how I'm going to do this afterwards. I'm going to exactly like this. I'm going to take all of our angles, drag them off there onto an external hard drive, and then compile them all onto the main iPad. Um, so I cut that, I guess, the journal um, comp compiling time and like in, into in a quarter yeah um, it speeds that up and then also your other devices aren't being tied down with all of those different files if it's a thing where you've done a broadcast and now you're basically out of room on your phone 
by using the drag and drop, it's a quick way to move files in general off of your device, but also for a Switcher Studio composition, you can move that video angle off your phone, get it onto your main iPad, that way you're back to having your storage on your iOS device at that point. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like as, as we said earlier, we're sorry Nick kind of had to bounce out there a little early on us. Um, we will hop in the comments and answer any other questions you all have there. Or, of course, you can always email us at support at switcherstudio.com. There's also this really cool thing I'm going to let Angela talk about for a little bit. That is our user group. Yeah, so our user group, we talk about it each week, but we do see a huge spike in new people coming in each week. So we're glad you guys are watching Stream Squad, listening, and joining. Uh, the user group is called Switcher Studio Enthusiasts. There are three ways to find it at this point. You can just search Switcher Studio Enthusiasts on Facebook. You can go to our Switcher Studio page where you're watching this right now. There's a tab that says groups and it'll give you a direct link into the group. Or if you type in the URL, uh, facebook.com slash group slash Switcher Studio, you can get there. Any of those will work. Once you're in, click join this group. There's gonna be a description over on the side with a short survey link. Click that link, fill out the survey. It just lets us know more of how you're using Switcher and how we can help to make Switcher even better. Uh, we go through it about once a day. We'll accept all the applicants in who've joined the group and done the survey. We're, uh, I think we're close to 800 at this point. It's grown super quick, but we've got a lot of enthusiastic users in there. They are constantly sharing their footage. They're sharing tips and tricks. If you're just getting started, it's the best place to be. You can see examples of what people are doing or even ask a question of, you know, I'm running a school event or a church event. What are some best tips to get started? Everyone's really nice and they'll help you out. Dan, Nick, Whitney, and I are also in the group, so we're also there to, you know, help moderate and help out. And also we get a lot of sneak peeks that go in the user group, so it pays off to be in there. So definitely make sure to go switch your studio enthusiasts and join the group. Again, we go through it about once a day and add in all the new entries and you guys can get started immediately with the fun. And as always, thank you everybody for tuning in. Uh, thank you for supporting us. We, uh, we love you all. And um, I think that's all the time we have for now. Like we said, we'll answer any other questions in the comments. And yeah, I yeah. think that's a wrap. We'll see you guys next week. See y'all.